Hi. Okay, we're getting ready to go into chapters 7, 8, and 9 of the book of Judges. We're going to continue with the story of Gideon. Uh, it's interesting now that we're going to actually go through uh, Gideon selecting his 300 men and sending people home, and we all know that story. I've always wondered maybe if uh, Gideon hadn't been so uh, picky about making God prove to him that he was going to be uh, with Gideon and he was going to give him the battle if he wouldn't have just let him take the army and go defeat them. Uh, but because Gideon uh, made him, uh, at least my opinion is, because Gideon made him prove twice that, uh, uh, that God had selected him, that God said, okay, we're going to do it uh, where you're really going to see that I'm in charge. It makes him do it with only 300 people. And, and that's uh, very, very good. But that's the bulk of the story of, of chapter 7. But Gideon continues on when we get to chapter 8. He's routed the people. He's, he's uh, chasing them. Uh, there's two more kings of the of the Midianites that he wants to catch, and he's chasing through them a guy named Ziba and Zalmunna, um, and they really don't play a big part in the story. It's really more the chase, and I want you to look at something. Uh, uh, Gideon gets over and uh, crosses the Jordan and gets to a city called Succoth. And there he says, we're tired. We need some help. We're chasing these two guys, and the rulers of the city won't help him. And I think it's interesting to see, we're going to see also the Ephraimites are, are questioning why he didn't uh, call on them. And you're starting to see some, some conflicts develop between the tribes. And as we get to the end of the book, we're going to find out that that's because there is no king. There's no unifying force. God intended for him to be the unifying force. Uh, but the people now, uh, the leaders of the cities or the leaders of the tribes, are all kind of looking out for themselves. And you'll see that as you go through, uh, go through chapter 8. Uh, chapter 8 ends with Gideon dies, and he has 70 sons. Uh, and the next story in chapter 9 is about one of those sons, Abimelech. And Abimelech goes, and he kills all of Gideon's sons. And oh, by the way, if you get confused when you're reading it, Gideon is referred to by two names in these chapters, both Gideon and uh, Jeroboam, Baal, I think is the way you're supposed to say it. Um, and so now it switches and it talks to him and refers to him as a son of uh, Jeroboam. And he kills all of them but the youngest son. And then he goes into the city of Shechem and he gets the people at Shechem to believe that he's in charge and all this stuff. And so the youngest son stands on a hillside and he hollers down and and says, uh, you know, you're following the wrong guy. Look what he did to my dad and, and my dad's family and all this stuff. And then you have this battle back and forth between the youngest and the oldest son and ultimately ends up with both of them dying. And it is just a continuation of the fact that once you have started down this path of violence, that violence continues to grow. They are not following God. There is no story in here at all uh, about uh, them being a follower of Yahweh. At the end, though, you see that, that God takes credit for, for punishing uh, those two families for what they did. So anyway, enjoy the reading. It's getting a little bit bizarre as we, as we get farther in. Uh, but next week, we will, I mean, tomorrow, we'll pick up with chapter 10. Hope you have a good evening. Good night.